The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Money GPS is an Australian fintech that has created leading digital advice technology to meet the unserved advice needs of the 90% of working Australians who cannot afford traditional advice. Users take a fully client-led digital journey with access to hybrid human advisor support across superannuation, investment, retirement and insurance topics. Money GPS offers a turnkey solution to financial advisors, helping to future-proof their business by engaging non-advised clients, enhancing referral relationships and achieving scale through a technology and personal advice solution. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I've got a last minute guest, Jade Jenkins from Bloom Financial Planning. Jade, thank you for uh, for fitting this in this afternoon. You've given up a gym uh, session. <laughs> you might need to uh, rebook that for later on. I feel bad now, um, but thank you for thank you for joining me for the podcast. Hi, James. No, not at all. Thank you for having me. I um I definitely took the easy way out today. Not going to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I ended up having to get up early in the morning to go to the gym. And so like yesterday after I was in the office, I'm at home now recording this, obviously with you, and yesterday I was in the office and it got to about three o'clock and I said to my colleagues sitting next to me, I'm like, oh, I could do with a nap now. I'd, I'd gotten up early to go to the gym before work because after work there's yeah, no, no chance of, of it happening. Oh, I used to be an early bird, absolutely. But yeah, no, the two little kids now kind of means that doesn't happen as easy as it used to. Yeah. <laughs> how do you go with two little kids in your financial planning business? How's that? How do you manage that? Yeah, it's been quite an interesting uh, dynamic. So we have that, but also my husband has a business where we have um, 10 staff in that business as well. So I'd been juggling kind of helping him with that, two little kids and working four days a week um, previously when I was employed. Yeah. Um, and then I kind of last minute decided to go out on my own and the kids were only in daycare four days a week and I've kind of continued that, um, which makes, you know, Wednesdays quite challenging when it used to be our day off together fun. Now it's kind of, okay, got to remember to give the kids some time because yeah, yeah, my husband and I kind of do the swap over when he gets home from work on a Wednesday hour where I can catch up on a bit of work. But um, I don't know, it's it's good. It's it's much better in the terms of that flexibility, you know. Yeah. It's not racing, having to get them up really early and get into the city by a certain time and all that sort of thing. Yeah. So is that when you're, before you went and, and started your own business, were you working in, in you Brisbane? In, in the Brisbane, yeah. In the city yeah. in Brisbane? In the city, yeah. Yeah. So doing sort of 50-50 hybrid work, half from home, half in the city, but um, a sucker for punishment. I quite like being in the office, so I would go in probably a little bit more than that anyway. Yeah. I often think about what it would have been like, so I've got two kids as well, but both of my kids are at primary school. And I often think about what it would be like for me to do my job now um, at the age my kids are now, kind of before COVID, when it was just expected that you were in the city Monday to Friday, nine till five. Uh, and I, and I, I drop off my kids at school a couple of days a week. So those days I'm not there until probably after nine. And then there's other days like today that I'm, that I'm at home and I can do the school pickup and so forth. Whereas before it would have been I would have been in before and after school care five days a week. My wife was working in an office job back then too. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think we're fortunate to have young kids in this kind of day and age and where you can start your business and work from home or, or whatever it is, or even if you are if you are employed, still have some type of flexibility to be partly in the office, partly at home. I wonder what it would always be like. Yeah. How did you? So how did? So what were you doing before you started your own business? You were working as an advisor. Just employed, were you, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I was working for Australian Unity for about six years. Oh six yeah. Years, and then they were purchased at the end of last year. Um, I'd sort of been thinking about being self-employed anyway. I grew up with self-employed parents. My husband and I started his business when I had a one-week-old baby. I was literally in hospital, like typing up his documents to start his business, and I thought, oh well. 
if I can do that for him and I've grown up around this, I can, you know, I've been a financial planner for a long time. I can do this business for myself. So yeah. it kind of came out by chance that the business was sold. So I just took the opportunity to rip the bandaid off and go for it. No, no better, no better time. What What's it like working in like, you know, a, a big business like the likes of Australian Unity? Like what, what type of financial advice are you doing there? Or, or is it just ordinary financial advice? Like, is it any different? What What's the go? It's quite interesting. So my clientele, my average clientele was a 65-year-old male ex-military, <laughs> um, which yeah. was because I actually was working for Bridgeport Financial Services prior to that, which were owned by NetWealth. They oh, yeah. to list on the ASX. Yeah. So that book was, prior to that, um, was developed by somebody that worked in the military and then saw a gap in the defined benefit schemes and decided to start a business in that. And then it eventually became at the hands of Australian Unity being passed around, sold off to different businesses. Oh, the book of clients that yeah. made its way to Australian Unity, right. Yeah. So I went with that from Bridgeport and um, a lot of it was, they had like defined benefit income streams and a lot of it was retirement advice that I was doing. Um, but that particular, I guess, business was acquired many different businesses along the way. So you could kind of look in the office and whilst we all worked for the same company, we all had very different books of clients that we managed. Like some people did predominantly SMSF stuff. Some people did more accumulator stuff. And my book just happened to be more retirement focused. Yeah. I think kind of that just depended on what business was acquired to, to make the Australian Unity business. Mm, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. And so how long have you had your own business for now? Oh, about seven months we're in now. Yeah, so seven months. <laughs> Baby steps. I'm entering toddlerhood, I guess. <laughs> I love it when, I, as I said before we pressed record, I, I tend to not prepare terribly much for these podcasts, and I love it when I ask that type of question, like, oh, you, like you're less than, less than a year in. So so what you know, what, what's it like? seven months in, is it terribly different to what you thought it would be like? I think, um, no. I, and I think having that self-employed background growing up and my husband, I kind of knew it wasn't going to be a walk in the park and it wasn't going to be all the flexibility that everyone kind of hopes that they're going to get. Um, but I think my biggest fear was like, where am I going to get clients? Because I had been at NAB, at Suncor, at Australian Unity, all of which had like internal referral sort of things going on. So I'd never had to look outside of the business that I worked in for new clients. Mm. Um, so that was probably the biggest challenge to begin with. But I think I was really open and honest with a lot of people around me in saying that, hey, like I'm so excited to be doing this, but I don't know where the hell I'm going to find clients. Uh, and all of a sudden, my accountant was like, oh, hey, we're exiting financial advice. Do you want to take over and do this? Yeah. And I had a you know previous someone that I'd worked with saying, hey, I'm taking over a business. Do you want to come and help? So those things that I guess I was worried about, now I'm not so worried about. And I have new challenges I didn't foresee. <laughs> yeah. So did, did, did you give it much thought, like oh, kind of ident identifying that as maybe – your, your most worrying point, did you, did you give it much thought before you went out on your own or, or, or that all just happened so quickly you, you kind of didn't have the time to do it? The wheels were always in motion, I guess, in terms of working myself for myself, um, which is where I guess started my uh, Instagram page 18 months ago now, which was ideally to find clients who were like me in their 30s and 40s with young kids. So I always knew that was where I was going to start, um, which interestingly actually just led me to a lot of other professional relationships which have now fostered growth and other um, referrals have come through that. So yeah. I knew I kind of had a starting point but I was just a, a little bit naive I guess as to where I was going to go and what I was going to do but it all kind of worked out okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you. So now you've so you, you kind of made it known amongst people that you already knew that hey I'm starting this business I don't know, did you openly ask them for referrals or you just like, you know, you're meeting with your accountant and say, I'm starting a new business. They're no doubt involved in you starting the new business in some way, shape or form. Exactly. And then and then it went from there? Like, yeah. What happened? Yeah, just, just that, like just, I guess, working at a lot of different businesses in the past, I've kind of kept connections along the way um, and just, you know, put it out on my social media that I was starting my business and all of that sort of thing. And people around me that I knew for a long time started going, oh, well, now you're going out on your own. Like, we're happy to, we want to help you and support you and send you clients. And it was, it was very surprising. And I'm very humbled by the support that I've received from people that are close to me in regards to that. That's amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. It, it, it makes you, makes you feel good that there's some good people out there, isn't there, that, that, that you know, see you giving it a crack and they're, and they're there to support you. So, so what, what's involved in, 
starting a financial planning business. Like I've never been through it. I've been an employee my whole kind of financial advice life. Where, yeah. where do you start? I guess no different from any other business. Like I just went down to my accountant and said, hey, <laughs> uh, I'm going to start a business, sort that out. And then very gratefully, I actually met Delene Jacovardi's uh, in oh, October yes. last year. Um, when I was kind of toying with the idea, it was really funny how everything kind of just played out. Um, and I'd spoken to her about how do you get started? And and a big part of that is finding a licensee, right? Like yes. they're a huge part of your business and they can have a huge effect on how you do your work and the costs that are involved and everything. So I kind of just relied on her experience and guidance and I was like, right, oh, well, I'll, I'll use the licensee that she used, which is Spark Advisors. And um, have been really happy with them. So it's probably the two biggest things are, you know, getting your structure set up and then finding a licensee and setting up some, I guess, referral networks if you don't already have them because you need to get business from somewhere. Yeah. There's a lot There's a lot of people that I've done had on the podcast, you know, Delene, you, you mentioned it, and others that are, that are with Spark, they they seem to get a good rap for people that have for one to for for a whole range of different reasons decided to go out on their own and, and starting from scratch. It sounds like they're really supportive of you doing that. Absolutely. I had a few little roadblocks when I first started um, and the support they gave me was incredible. Like over the weekend and everything when I was stressing about various things in the lead up to Christmas, I always felt there was support there immediately where I needed it. Yeah. Um, and even now, if you need anything, you know, Arthur, the CEO, he's available on the phone almost any time of the day that you need. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how he ever sleeps. Um, it is really nice to know that you have that. And I think Spark kind of look for like-minded advisors. Um, so I think that's what it makes it a good group because everyone's kind of, I guess, that bit more newer age type of advice that it's shifting mm. to. Yeah. I was Certainly those that I've had on the podcast of all, all of pretty much a similar age anyway. I don't know if that just happens to be I'm, I'm interviewing people on a podcast that are similar age to me as well. But yeah, but yeah you all, all, all seem to be fairly similar, which is, which is fantastic. It's so nice, It's nice to be part of a group like that, yeah. It, 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 so you mentioned it, it, at previous business you had this kind of cohort of clients that were kind of military type. It, it, is that... Is, is your demographic of client changed now that you're that you're working with you know, on your own? Hugely. So I guess yeah. I've marketed my business. If you have a look at my website, my Instagram, very girly or fun mm, or bright. Yeah. yeah. Um. And I think part of that is I'm a boy mom and I work in finance, which can be very black and white. <laughs> so trying to bring a bit of creativity, but um, I'm definitely wanting. I'm definitely wanting to work with people who are like me, thirties, forties, navigating careers, kids, mortgages. There's a lot of moving parts um, and a lot of businesses that I worked in before wrote them off and said, there's no money. We basically mm-hmm. don't want to spend our time doing that. Um, but I was like, well, <laughs> the advice industry average is about 30 years older than me. So surely there's a few clients that I could be helping out with here. Uh, so yeah, so mostly they're, they're the younger 30s and 40s, but um, I do definitely still have a few in that pre-retirement space. My parents are at that age, so it kind of just naturally fit across those two yeah. demographics. Yeah, yeah. And and, and, the, and are these, you know, the 30, 40 year olds, couple of kids, mortgage, all of that kind of thing going on, are they finding you through Instagram and and, and other means? Like how, how are they coming across you? Yeah, so a lot through Instagram. Um, I do have a great referral. She's a mortgage broker with a huge <laughs> Instagram um following, I suppose, where she's sending a great deal of clients as well. So yeah, well, a lot of the younger ones will come through social media channels, whether it's through me or other social media, people that are on social media, essentially, who know yeah. me that way. And a couple have been a bit more local to me just through my accountant and whatnot. But yeah, most of the younger demographic are online. Yep. And how do you, what, can you talk through your your interactions with them? Like what what's your financial advice process look like, your meeting process? Can you talk through that? Um, it's probably more involved than it ever has been, I think. Um, so essentially, it's kind of a bit of a four-step process, I get Maybe not overly different from what anyone else does when you have an initial chat and figure out if you're sort of the right fit for each other. Um, I do spend a lot of time initially going through goals and actually figuring out what that means. Yeah. Especially I find a lot of people in their 30s and 40s will say, oh, we want to have a passive income and we want to do this, that and the other. And you're like, well, what does that actually mean to you? And and how much do you want? And um, actually breaking that down properly. And also really like spending a lot of time uh, on people's values and how they kind of grew up 
you know, is there an indirect reflection of how they spend their money now and working through differences that couples have with their money? Because often you'll have a, you know, a spender and a saver and all those yeah. sorts of things. So a lot of time spent on that whole side of things. I'm a bit of a fan of psychology, so I love to kind of get in people's minds a little bit and, and have a chat about that. So is that like a whole meeting that you dedicate to those those kind of topics? It would fall into with the initial um initial meeting. So going yep. through all the normal stuff in your initial meeting, but more of a focus on on that side of things, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to strategy or anything, I suppose. But then we do I do have a strategy meeting afterwards where I do a little bit of modeling and can have those conversations about, hey, what you want to do is or isn't going to work. What's the backup plan? Is there something else we could do? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Or then in kind of a normal plan presentation, implementation follow up. Yeah. yeah. Pretty standard, I think. But maybe yep. it's a little bit of a different conversation. Yeah, maybe sounds sounds like it's similar to the to the typical financial advice conversation, and then like how you know you're only seven months or so in. How how are you engaging with these clients on like a fee basis? And I don't mean by what are you charging? You know, you'll mm-hmm. just like you'll, you'll run your business. How you're going to run your business? But but is it? Do you find you're doing a lot of like one off type work? Is are you are you engaging them in like a twelve month? Program, which I've you know, spoken to a few other financial advisors that are doing things that way. What 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 approach have you taken? At the moment, I'm doing like upfront for a lot of the younger once off type stuff, but I'm trying to develop a little bit more of an ongoing program that's more tailored to their sort of style because I found it's really easy pre retirees and whatnot. You know, they're kind of used to that ongoing advice and that sort of thing. Um, whereas I guess the younger demographic they have so many things changing and they actually could really benefit from it yeah. and so it's trying to actually get a really good ongoing service program for them that I would like to have something that's a bit more of a community type of feel for them that they can be involved with uh, as as opposed to the more traditional ongoing service arrangements I suppose yeah, yeah. yeah. but there's probably it's probably like 80 20 80 percent is upfront uh, and 20 percent sort of end up being ongoing oh right yeah, yeah. And- I really like your comment there about the older ones, the older clients, maybe more more gravitating towards that. I, I reckon it's it's in us as well because I'm the, I'm the same. Uh, I reckon we're more more comfortable positioning that because you've done it for the last 10, 15, 20 years, however long you've been working in financial advice, versus the 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 younger clients that you haven't. Someone I was speaking to a, 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 a little while ago, they were they were doing the the, the kind of the engagement for that younger demographic of client where I do it and it sounds like you do it you tend to charge like it is a one-off project fee we'll do a little bit of work for you for a period of time and then call me up later on if you need some help later on they're not doing it that way at all they're saying our our initial project our one-off piece of work is actually a 12-month engagement with you and we'll do the SOA and we'll do the implementation and we'll do all of these kind of things but then towards the end of that 12-month engagement there's a there's a review meeting of sorts and whatever they've designed around their review meeting. And I thought that was a really good way of engaging with them because you're, you're right. Like that. Yeah. You'll get you'll you'll do some initial advice and these younger clients, six months down the track, you've you know, you've just about wrapped up the implementation, but something's changed and you need to revisit the advice again. Yeah, actually I'm gonna take that on board because I think that's a really good approach um yeah. to it. Because there is so much that does change for young people very quickly, you know. New babies or whatever it is that pops up. <laughs> I I haven't spent the time myself just in my own process to work out how do I. It's really how do I change the, it's that initial conversation when I'm describing to clients how do we engage with you. I just need to come up with a different way of explaining it to say you know it's a twelve month engagement and we're going to charge you a particular fee in quarterly installments or however you're going to charge the fee. But at least that then gives you more time to actually help with that transformation that you're trying to do in the first year and get them into the review process. So a shout out to a if you person <laughs> listening will probably hear this and remember the conversation we're having. Thank you. So, for that. <laughs> so what are you so in, in terms of your your business in terms of personnel, is is it just you? Are you using any support staff, whether inside in, in Australia or outside, what, what's the what's the setup that way? Yeah, it has been me for the last seven months, but I'm just about to start a, um, well, she's a VA, she's onshore based in Adelaide, yep. um, but she's done kind of everything from data implementation up to power planning and signing on client meetings, and she's doing a financial planning degree at the moment. So oh, I think she'll be a real asset to um, the business. She's just going to work kind of like a subcontractor, I suppose, in the sense that I'll just 
outsource, I guess what we're going to do is probably start with the outsourcing plans. She's yep. going to do the power planning. She's going to then do the implementation as well. So kind of taking over from power planning phase, which will be awesome. <laughs> um, but she's also really handy when it comes to the everyday running of the business. So I'm going to spend some time with her and get her to set up some threads and wizards and whatnot that'll help me moving forward that I need to set up, but I just don't have the time. So <laughs> it'll be good. To see. I think she'll be a bit of a right-hand woman for a while. So you're even doing your own power planning no, sorry. So I had been doing a bit of it initially yeah. in the really, really early days. Um, yeah. But no, I've I've been outsourcing. Spark have their own um, power planning team. So I was just oh. using them initially. Yeah. So they've had all my plans the last few months, but they'll um, they'll then go to this lady that I'm going to use for yeah. the rest of it. Yeah. And you, like if, you, if you're using services like that from your licensee, is that, is that part of the fee? Do you pay for the licensee or do you pay, you know? A hundred dollars per plan, or whatever the going rate is per per plan, you, you pay for every every plan you send through to the power planning unit. Yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah. pay for it, and I would say it's like market rate with what you pay an outsourced power planner anyway, sort of thing. Yeah, because yeah. 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 I was going to say you do you're doing well if you're doing the client meetings, you're doing the power planning, <laughs> try to manage implementation all on your own. It no, sounds like no you've got some new. It, it sounds like you're not like you, you've got a You've got a degree of new clients coming to you anyway to, to keep you pretty busy. So you yeah. want to get some of that off your plate as soon as you can. And I think it's hard when you're, you know, starting out in a business initially and I probably needed her three months ago, but I was like, oh, do I really want to pay? You know, I, I could I could do this myself, surely. I'll save the money. And then you just end up costing yourself more because yeah. you don't have the time to go and see those clients or build business or whatever it is that you need to be doing outside of the business. Yeah. It's good of you to say that because that, that, that bit comes up a lot with people that are just starting their business. They say, "Oh, when I can, well, I'll, I'll employ this person when I can afford this person." But really, that you should have employed them six months ago. Absolutely, uh, to, to, you would you would have been far better off as a result of it. So, do you see everyone online? Are you're you're are you do what you're working from home, or do you work from somewhere else, or what do you work from? Mostly online. At Brisbane, I try, at Brisbane, Gold Coast, Sunny Coast, I will meet face to face. I still miss that in-person interaction um so oh yeah online for anyone that comes through interstate based but i'll try and meet with people so my accountant has me in their office meeting their clients and then i also hire a meeting room here on the goldie end on the sunshine coast wherever i'm traveling to just so that people can kind of come to me and i can see everyone all at once sort of thing yeah yeah and do you find you have just is it uh, are you spending like time overnight? Like if you're traveling somewhere, are you spending time overnight or are you not, there no, in the day? It's not that far. So I'm halfway between Brizzy and the Gold Coast anyway. Ah, right. Yeah. Right. The Gold Coast is easy. The Sunny Coast is a bit further and I have considered spending the night. But uh, two young kids and a self-employed husband makes that pretty difficult um, when he's out the door at five o'clock. So. Yeah, I would have thought so. But do you, so do you, do you have some, some kind of longer term plans for your business? Or have you given... So we're on a growth trajectory at the moment. Um, I'm upwards from here. I ideally would like to have an office space here locally um, in my oh, local area. Actually have a, sp- a space that you're in permanently. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I really miss that office feel um, mm. and that team environment. I've always played a lot of team sports, I think, growing up, and I, I would like to have somewhere to go. I don't particularly love working from home, so that's a plan. I don't, you know, how big I want to get, hopefully, you know, I don't, that will come over time, but mm. it's not. Not, um, you know, I don't want to go and have 10 advisors or do anything crazy like that initially. Yeah. Here we are. We'll see how we go in five years. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you back on in a couple of years' time and you've you built an empire un- underneath you? So so an office space in, in the not-too-distant future would be would be next for you? That would be ideal. And yeah. then other little projects I'm sort of working on at the moment, i have just developing an online course because I find a lot of clients kind of come to you with no real financial literacy mm. at all. Uh, and there's also people that I would love to help that I just kind of have to turn away and say, look, you're not in that position for me to well, to pay for my fees, really, yeah. is what it comes down to. And I still want to give them something. Uh, so I'm just making a little online course at the moment that um, and people will be able to purchase and, and work through that. So that's taking up a little bit of time as well. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a few other advisors that use that, that kind of idea quite well in that, one, you can direct people that aren't a great fit for you that need some help to it. But then also the other way, some people that find your course somehow through your promotion on Instagram or, or wherever else, that then off the back of it then become good clients for you to to work with. It's a bit of a lead generation thing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. 
What about technology wise? What are you using technology wise within your within your business? Oh, you good old X Plan. X Plan are Envoyant for modeling. Yeah. Um, they're probably the only two that um yeah I'm using at the moment. Nothing nothing fancy. I'm well no, I'm millennial, but I'm not overly happy, I would say. I reckon you're the third person third person in uh, within as many weeks that's mentioned buoyant. Someone uh Oh, there you go. So, someone reached out because someone had heard me on the podcast saying, I've never heard of Voyant before, and everyone's talking a lot about Voyant and how good it is for doing the modelling and interacting with clients. It's, it's, got a, it's got a good rap the last few weeks, and someone's reached out to me on LinkedIn. I've got to organise a time to, to to catch up with them. They're going to give me a demo of Voyant so I can, yeah, I can I see what like it's it. like. Yeah. yeah. Yep. The, the, the content that you put out online, how do you – you know, do you, do you spend much time doing that? Where do you come up with ideas? Do you do it all yourself? Can you can you talk a bit about that that part of your business? I'd like to spend a bit more time doing that because it has really direct, fast impact. I feel like every time I put up something, there's new inquiries. Um, so I, I do know that is going to be a big lead generator if you know I spent enough time into that. It's sort of just something that started just out of boredom and looking for new clients that are a bit more aligned to me. Um, and yeah, I just have a notebook in my phone, I guess, with probably a hundred dot points at the moment of things that I think of um, conversations from clients in meetings. I'm now sort of jotting down after a meeting going, okay, that's what we spoke about. That's good. I would share that. And, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Like the other day I shared a Div 293 thing because I had a client that was like, oh, I'm on a payment plan for it. And I'm like, mate, you can pay it from your super. You what know. are you doing? <laughs> yeah, you earn so much money and you're on a payment plan for this. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, obviously we're giving him financial advice. But, um, yeah, it, it's just stuff that I sort of think about. If I, have a, if I have a coffee and I go for a long drive, that's normally my best time to come mm. up with content. And, and the style of content, what, what can you talk through the style of content you're doing, like videos, static posts, like what, what, what's that mix like for anyone uh, that's listening? Um, so the videos probably are easier because mm. you kind of can just have a quick chat and post them and I find that they do a lot better than any static posts that I put up. Yeah. Um, static posts I put up sometimes, but they take too much time, to be honest. They're sort of a bit fiddly. Yeah, I find the same. It's much easier to just talk to the camera and go, oh, that post and yeah. Yeah, and, and easier, you know, I'm getting more comfortable seeing myself online. I think that's been a huge barrier. I just, yeah. I'll post it and I won't look at it. And I'll hear my husband listening, I'm like, it down, I don't, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> my, my wife, my wife, because I, you know, did stop the videos that I do. My wife's like, you stop looking at videos of yourself. <laughs> I've got sick of I'm sick of listening to you, listening to your voice. Get it all the time. Well, that's so funny. Yeah. I must say my mum loves your content. So I was gonna yeah. I was just about to br- <laughs> I was just about to bring that up. We we uh we shared a and a kind of a, a funny message I guess backwards and forwards there a, a little while ago. You'd sent me a message saying your mum saw my videos and you know, they made some sense or something to her. Uh, and then, like it's it's and we're kind of both experiencing the same thing. My parents are clients of mine. It sounds like your parents are probably clients of yours too. Probably doing the same kind of thing. My parents are retired, all all the rest of it. But it's not until they watch the videos, it's like, oh yeah, this. So it kind of, it kind of just reinforces that we think we're doing a good job of explaining something to the client in the meeting, but. They may very well get it in the meeting, but they've probably forgotten it by the time they go to the lift and they go downstairs and they leave the building. Um, the, the videos you're putting online or the videos I'm putting online are just that good reinforcer of the things that we're already doing with clients. And I think sometimes you're in a meeting, you cover a lot of ground, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff that clients are going to forget the minute they walk out the door because they kind of don't understand it to start with. But if they've sort of, I guess, heard you talk about it and then you, they see a snippet, it, yeah, you're right. It jogs their memory and they go, oh, that's right. I understand yeah. it now. Yeah. And so that, that, the content ends up being really great from a new client acquisition perspective. Yeah, that's fantastic. And there's plenty of people doing some some good stuff in that in that space. But it's really helpful for your existing clients too. Like Facebook has an interesting feature where they, I know once a week they they prompt me to say, oh, you've got some new top fans or something. These are your three top fans. And I looked at it last week and one of the names was a top fan is a client of mine that's been a client for like 15 years. Oh, wow. Uh, and and so it's, it's, again, it's kind of reinforcing, you know, I'm talking about superannuation or tax or retirement or Div 293 or whatever. All of this stuff that I would have spoken to this client about for the last 15 years, but they're seeing it on Facebook as well and it just 
reinforces it. And I think it's good for your clients that you do, you know, see on a regular basis that you're still in front and centre of their mind if they're following you. Um, you know, you can sort of find some people, especially in, in roles I've had in the past where you might see them once a year and not really do too much in the meantime and then uh, they might drag the chain getting into a review and whatnot. But if you're front and centre all the time, then it's like, oh, that's right, we've got to, you know, they're coming in to me and, you know, they're a bit more enthusiastic about things, I think. Yeah, yeah. And there's certain topics you'll talk about that they've already seen you talking about online, so that makes that part of the job a bit easier. Just one thing that I just just popped into my mind, you were talking about the younger clients and I'm going to do something like on a group structure. John Pasha, I think he's with Spark as, as, as well. I know he does that. If you haven't reached out to him, you should have re- reach out reach out to him. Whereas he tries to do, last time I was explaining it to me, and I'm not a client of his, so I haven't participated in it, but it was something along the lines of, like a Q&A type session, you know, there's an edu- a bit of an education piece and then a Q&A type session, but he gets similar types of clients together all on the, yeah. all on the webinar. That'd be interesting for you to Yeah, definitely. To look it's it one of those things that you like, you've got your long list of stuff that you want to yeah. do in the business and they're like, okay, I've got to go and actually see clients and then we'll try and do the rest of this stuff at some point. It's hard, isn't it? Where do you, you know, work, working in the business versus working on the business. Oh, absolutely. And sometimes I prefer one over the other, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe, look, thanks for joining me this afternoon. Uh, good to chat. Good to get to know you. Uh, I appreciate you joining me on the podcast. Thanks, James. It was nice to meet you finally. <laughs> <laughs>